Hello, everybody. Welcome to the HEI webinar series. Um, we're going to begin the webinar now. Just a few housekeeping announcements. All attendees are muted for the duration of the webinar. There'll be a three minute Q&A period after each speaker reserved for short technical questions and in-depth questions will be reserved for the 40 minute panel discussion Q&A period at the, end of the, um, at the end of the session. Please submit all questions via the Q&A function at any time during the webinar. You can also upvote questions in the Q&A. If you experience any logistical difficulties, please contact us using the chat box. All webinar slides and video will be available in the coming weeks. Check out our website for details. And a, a pop-up will um, appear after the webinar is over. Please provide any feedback that you have. We take that into consideration um, when we plan our conference for next year. And registration for information for upcoming webinars is available on the HEI website. So our webinar today is Environmental Health Research and Community Stories of Successes and Challenges. Our chairs are Dr. Francesca Dominici, who is a member of the HEI Research Committee, and Dr. Peter Thorne, who is a member of the HEI Energy Research Committee. We have a great lineup of speakers today, Dr. Christina Fuller, Dr. Paul English, Mr. Luis Olmeda, and Dr. Ana Navas Asien. Um, we have a wonderful agenda planned today. Speakers will discuss their own environmental health research and experiences working with communities and associated successes and challenges. And we'll have a panel discussion and Q and A session at the end when all the speakers are finished. So um, I'm gonna introduce, um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and introduce Dr. Francesca Dominici. Um, she's the director of the Harvard Data Science Initiative and the Clarence James Gamble Professor of Biostatistics, Population and Data Science at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. She is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and of the International Society of Mathematical Statistics. She leads an interdisciplinary group of scientists with the ultimate goal of addressing important questions in environmental health science, climate change, and health policy. Dr. Dominici has provided the scientific community and policymakers with robust evidence on the adverse health effects of air pollution, noise pollution, and climate change. Thanks, Dr. Dominici. Thank you. Thank you. It's my, it's my pleasure to chair the session today. I will give some very brief introductory remarks. Um, we all know that pollution is not even distributed in the United States. Community of colors, indigenous community, and low income communities are significantly more likely to suffer sickness and death from high level of air pollution, contaminated drink water, and close proximity to toxic waste sites. Afro Americans are 55% are more likely to live in areas of heavy air pollution, and poor community are 35% more likely. Recent scientific research presents compelling evidence that communities with high level of air pollution have also significant higher level of coronavirus infection, hospital admission, and deaths. Three out of five Amer Afro-American live in close proximity to toxic sites, leading to higher rates of cancer, great likelihood of birth defects and autism, and countless other avoidable illnesses. Many environmental justice communities lack the basic resources most Americans take for granted. One in eight nat Native Americans lacks reliable access to water, and Black families are twice as likely as white families to live without modern plumbing. Black children are nearly three times more likely than white children to have unsafe blood lead levels. In this seminar, you will learn from experts on this topic. The following general topics will be discussed. You will hear from Christina Fuller on how do we strengthen science and justice through community involvement. She will talk about the environmental justice mob movement, the principle of environmental justice, and example collaboration of environmental justice community. We will hear from Paul English and Luis Olmedo all made regarding community man monitoring and low cost sensors and how to democratize data and science. Also in the context of community participation structure and best practices. Furthermore, you will hear from Hannah Navas Ancien on environmental health inequity in indigenous community. And she will provide recommendation for community-based research with tribes. 
And finally, also she will conclude with a thoughtful discussion of data ownership. Before starting to introduce the, the speaker, it would be my pleasure to also introduce uh, Dr. Peter Turn, a member of the HCI Review Committee who will moderate the panel at the end. Dr. Torn is a member of the HEI Energy Research Committee, professor and head of the Department of Occupational and Environmental Health at the University of Ohio College of Public Health. He's an associate director and co-founder of the Interdisciplinary Graduate Program in Human Toxicology. His research interests are in environmental risk factor for um, inflammatory lung disease, toxicity of engineered nano materials and persistent environmental pollutants and novel methods for exposure assessment and mod modeling. Dr. Turn holds an MS in biomedical engineer and a PhD in toxicology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He will moderate, as I said, the question and answer with the, with the panelists at the end. Now it's with my great pleasure that I'm gonna introduce the first speaker Dr. Christina Fuller. Uh, Dr. Fuller specializes in exposure assessment and environmental epidemiology. Her research spans topics including the spatial characterization of air pollution, community engaged research, environmental justice, and urban health. She currently studies the ability for three barriers to reduce near road air pollution, as well as the joint effects of air pollution and social factors on cardiovascular health. She is an associate professor at the Georgia State University School of Public Health. Dr. Fuller, I am turning to you. Thank you very much, Francesca, for that lovely introduction. my slides up. Okay. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. I have been working in the field of environmental health research for over 15 years. And before that, I did environmental engineering and nonprofit work. So air pollution has been the focus of my research for much of that time. And today I'm going to discuss the history and purpose of environmental justice and how community engagement is part of its principles. After which I'll give some personal examples on how this has worked out in practice in my own research. So first it's important to understand that air pollution is not distributed equally between populations. So this is a map from the World Health Organization, which shows annual average PM 2.5 concentrations for countries across the globe. And what is evident is that worldwide PM 2.5 levels are higher for developing countries, especially in East and Southeast Asia, the Middle East, and also Africa. And a recent estimate of the burden of disease from ambient air pollution is evidence for the air pollution effects about 4.2 million excess deaths worldwide and 103 million dailies. The sources include power generation, coal and natural gas, uh, traffic related air pollution, both from gasoline and diesel vehicles, many kinds of manufacturing processes, and even wind blown dust and sand. So there is also a great deal of variation at the local scale. The map here shows the downtown area of Atlanta, my current home city. And you can see that PM 2.5 concentrations vary also on a smaller scale. Here we're looking at major streets that are the black lines. And you can see the um, overlay of the different um, neighborhoods and blocks below that. And a driving force behind the air pollution in this city is traffic exhaust from cars and trucks and gradients and exposure will vary to a certain degree depending on the pollutant under evaluation. There's been a great deal of research on the physical determinants of air pollution concentrations, and they pertain to the position of sources within the built environment, emission levels, and meteorology. However, in addition to that are the upstream conditions that control where sources are located, what they release and who lives close by. 
industry tends to cluster together in specific locales due to the price of land and zoning practices. And this can put certain populations at a disadvantage. There are also specific practices such as redlining that it adversely impacts black and other communities of color, putting them at a greater proximity to sources. And although redlining was a uh, decisions from the past, it impacts environment exposures to this day. Historically poor minority and immigrant communities and also Native Americans have been located close to roads. Even the federal highway system was laid out in a manner that deliberately ran through specific racial and ethnic minority communities. And these associations are often persistent, but they are also dynamic. It can change quickly, particularly in urban areas where there are some neighborhoods that are rapidly gentrifying. So these are similar, there are similar patterns in air pollution exposure across cities in other parts of the United States and also in cities across the globe. In response to this adverse and disproportionate impacts on particular communities, there has been resistance as well. Most agree that a watershed moment beginning the environmental justice movement took place in Warren County, North Carolina in the late 1970s and early 1980s. And the community organized itself around resisting the placement of a polychlorinated biphenyl um, hazardous waste disposal site there, which was put in the county that was predominantly black and predominantly low income. They organized themselves for, to conduct different nonviolent protests. And although their efforts were not immediately successful and the landfill was built, they continued their organizing and um, nonviolent protests. And eventually the site was cleaned up and closed many years later. Warren County highlighted the injustice taking place there to a national level. In response, there was interest in evaluating waste sites across the country. And one of the first seminal works examining environmental injustice was Toxic Waste and Race in the United States. And this report was written in 1987 by the United Church of Christ and examined the link between hazardous waste sites, both for storage and for disposal and race and ethnicity. Specifically, they evaluated burdens on African Americans, Native Americans, Pacific Islanders, Asian Americans, and Hispanics. And their assessment found that race was the most significant variable associated with the location of commercial hazardous waste facilities. In fact, three out of five landfills were in majority Black and Hispanic communities. Three of every Blacks and Hispanic Americans lived in communities with uncontrolled toxic waste sites. And half of Asian Pacific Islanders and Native Americans lived in communities with uncontrolled waste sites as well. So they found that race was the most significant variable associated with the locations. And income was also important, but it was second to race. The study was repeated after 20 years in 2007 and found that little has changed. And additional studies from multiple researchers still are finding the same effects to this day. So to address the issues highlighted in this report and other examples from across the country required an expansion of what the environment was and how we dwell within it as well. The traditional environmental movement began with a focus on conservation of native flora and fauna, and it is a top-down approach with large, large organizations and the government setting the agenda. The environmental justice movement, on the other hand, is a grassroots movement, which is broad and loosely organized. And that is to say that it relies on a bottom-up approach. A dedication to preserving natural landscapes, plants, and animals are still there but also adding to that is our place um, within that fabric, including creating healthy food sources, educating young people about sustainability, building healthier cities, public health outcomes, and maintaining indigenous cultural practices. 
EJ can be achieved when everyone enjoys the same degree of protection from environmental health hazards and has equal access to the decision-making process to have a healthy environment in which to live, learn, and work. And environmental justice has its roots in the United States, but inequity is not an American phenomenon only. So environmental justice struggles and successes take place all across the world. I like this figure because it shows uh, in a picture form of the purpose of environmental justice. So first is to identify where there are inequalities and then to move from equality, which is lifting up everyone to a certain extent, which doesn't benefit all people. But going forward into equity, which is the provision of resources and support according to needs. And better yet is on the far right. So that's to break down the barriers and establish true justice and new alternatives. Instead of simply removing where hazardous waste sites are located to make them equitably spaced, why not remove hazardous materials from products? Instead of putting barriers to reduce air pollution near roads, perhaps we can have more transit and electric cars. Now in 1991, the environmental justice activists of the time joined together for the 1991 First National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit. And that took place in Washington, DC. And not only were many racial and ethnic groups from the US in attendance, but also from across the world. They established 17 principles of environmental justice. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'm instead going to highlight three that relate to today's topic. So the first is how environmental justice uh, affirms the fundamental right to political, economic, cultural, and environmental self-determination. How environmental justice demands the right to participate as equal partners and how environmental justice calls for the education of present and future generations. So increasing engagement in research embodies these environmental justice principles. So engagement is not a specific formula, but is instead a continuum. Partners can take a multi partnerships can take a multitude of shapes as outlined in, the, outlined in this figure. So on the far left-hand side, you have outreach, where researchers conduct a study about air pollution and asthma, for example, and then share findings with community members. In the middle, you have projects that consult, involve, or collaborate with partners. That means involving them in different parts of the research, either in generating it, um, doing outreach, or um, disseminating information. And that's another group of, uh, I guess, class of um, collaboration. And then on the far right, you have community-based participatory research in which there is shared, shared leadership between environmental groups, residents, and researchers. And also where the research questions actually come from the community. Um, and that's the real source. That's the most thorough kind of community-based participatory research. And I think it's important to know that not all projects necessarily need to be community-based participatory research to be very helpful and respectful of communities. Each one of these has its place in research. So I just have a little bit of time. So I'm going to talk about two successful collaborations in which I have been involved in recent years. So the first is a community assessment of freeway exposure and health, um, which is a relationship between the academic and community partners, which began in 2005. And the first grant was funded in 2008. And I became involved in this um, research partnership as a doctoral student at the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, and is led by um, Dr. Doug Bruge. So my role when I first began was working with CAFE was as a student member of the Community Advisory Board or the CAB. And I did research around air pollution and specifically this was focused on ultrafine particle concentrations in near highway environments and biomarkers of inflammation and blood pressure. 
And it was a CBR, CBPR project that came from the um, collaborations between community groups in the Boston area and universities. And since this time, I've continued after graduation as a collaborator on subsequent projects. And now CAFE has expanded to five separate studies. And just to go over some of the successes, I would say that some are, you know, real robust science has come out of this project, including detailed air pollution maps that um, have been published in lots of different locations. In addition to that, are interactive maps. And these are designed so that community members can be truly involved, knowledgeable about air pollution exposures in their neighborhoods. Also, the assessment of health impacts as well is very key. So at first, it began looking at inflammation and blood pressure, but subsequent projects have examined diabetes, asthma, and other outcomes. So this added to the scientific understanding of associations between ultrafine particle exposures and outcomes. And researchers have used that data to even estimate health burdens for particular communities that are involved in the projects. And lastly, which I think is also really important with community engaged projects is that it's not just solely to look at exposures and write papers, but to really generate results. So there have been evaluation of active filtration um, of particles into the indoor environment, establishing buffers between traffic corridors and populations. And those can be sound barriers, sound walls, or even green infrastructure. Okay, so approximately 60 journal articles on ultrafine particles have come out related to the study in addition to a book that Doug Brugge and I um, just co-edited called Ambient Combustion Ultrafine Particles and Health. And this just shows the different um, projects that emerged over time. The second one that I'm going to talk about very briefly, briefly is the Hercules Exposome Research Center, which is ongoing center between Emory University and Georgia Tech. And it was funded first by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. And so as you can see here, I'm actually a member of the stakeholder advisory boards, which is made up of different stakeholders. And what's very innovative about this project is that it includes um, projects that community members and organizations have been able to generate for themselves, education materials as well. And some are highlighted here, and I can go back to this in the question and answer portion. And then also it engages the researchers from the universities to community members in that direction as well. So it's very much bi-directional. And it has had real impact in terms of even um, identifying risks that were going on in West Atlanta with lead exposures from people's yards. And that has been leveraged to actually get funds from the EPA to clean up sites. That's real impact. So um, my final slide is just showing how the benefits for the community and for research. So it really makes the research for community members, first of all, very relevant answering relevant research questions. It demystifies the science and really helps to quantify some of the exposures and outcomes that they see every day. Um, it's important on the research end to really incorporate specific knowledge from community members um, that helps us to better quantify exposures and outcomes and to catalyze solutions that can be more readily adapted for communities to implement. Some of the challenges are that this all takes time and building community um, connections takes dedication, time, many times before you actually get funding to do a project. It's difficult sometimes to balance research and community priorities. And you also have to be very knowledgeable about the power dynamics between community members, residents, and academics. That can be unwieldy and you have to understand that and then find ways to mitigate that and make it uh, more equal playing field. 
So I think my time is just about up. So I'm happy to talk about this um, if you have questions and then with the question and answer portion later. So um, thank you very much. Also want to acknowledge the funders for those two um, projects and thank you. Thank you, Christina. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce the next two speakers. Um, Dr. Paul English is director of Track in California, a program of the Public Health Institute in Oakland, California. Track in California conducts community-based environmental health research and develops surveillance system for environmental hazards, exposures, and environmentally related chronic disease. Dr. English received his master's in public health and doctorate in epidemiology at the University of California, Berkeley, and has published extensively in the peer review literature. He will, have, he will present uh, his talk together with Mr. Luis Olmedo. Luis Olmedo has served as executive director for nearly two decades, where he has led a team of local visionaries in development of evidence-based health intervention, sensor measurement engineering, programming and crowdsourcing, designing new gover government frameworks and service programs, and crafting new multimedia collaborative models, all with the goal of achieving equity and environmental justice for disadvantaged community. Paul and Luis, I leave you to the floor. Thank you, Francesca. Um, Luis and I are going to um, kind of tag team this, this presentation. So I'm gonna start my, uh, my video right now. Okay. There we go. Uh, so what today we're gonna talk about um, implications for air quality monitoring and citizen science from a, a project that we worked on um, in Imperial County, California. Um, and the, the context of this uh, presentation is there's been a history of community-led air monitoring efforts. And now we're seeing new opportunities with a next generation of low cost air sensors. And uh, the goal of a lot of these of these projects is to democratize data and science and to leverage community knowledge and capacity. Um, and uh, community air monitoring we see as a, a complement, not a replacement to regulatory monitoring. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Here's the project background. Um, this is in Imperial Cal County, California, and Luis is going to talk in a minute about uh, more of the background of um, some of the environmental challenges, environmental health challenges they have there. Um, they have historically uh, failed to meet uh, standards for the uh, coarse or respirable uh, particulate matter. They have um, the, some of the highest rates of, of asthma in, in that county in California, a limited number of regulatory monitors and need for higher resolution air quality data. This was funded by the uh, National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, a research to action grant um, started in 2014. So the main project partners were uh, the Tracking California program of the Public Health Institute, uh, Comité Civico de Valle, and uh, University of Washington, uh, Dr. Edmund Cito's lab. Um, and so, uh, Luis, I was just wondering if you could now uh, talk a little bit um, about some of the uh, community contexts and maybe just briefly about um, how the partnership originated between uh, tracking and Comite. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. English. Um, Imperio just suffers from uh, uh, numerous sources of uh, air pollution. I mean, air pollution isn't the only issue. It, it is a very visible issue. Um, and um, to start off, I actually met Paul through another project that was happening here also through the California Department of, Department of Public Health at the time we're doing some an asthma study and I, I still remember the day where we were sitting there with multiple researchers out of the Bay Area uh, in San Francisco Oakland area and uh, Richmond um, and they were looking at agricultural burning and and um, we see agricultural burning 
happening throughout the entire year and more um, frequently during, you know, rotation of, of crops. And I, th I think some of the remarks was like, what's happening around us? You know, it looked like some kind of war zone. Um, that really got me to, to kind of take a second look at what would, had become part of the scenery. And um, so, you know, there's agricultural burning, there's uh, air pollution from, you know, particulate matter. If you see the map on the lower left hand uh, side of your screen, uh, you can clearly see that the northern end, California is a agricultural community. Throw a warehouse in any one of those green patches and brown patches, you have heavy industry happening in open air. Uh, on the south side, you see a large metropolitan city, uh, which also becomes an issue because we get both the rural heavy industry, the desert, um, and then the, the large metropolitan sources from manufacturing and uh, numerous other sources coming from Mexico. Uh, so we always get dealt a pretty uh, um, unfair uh, um, hand when it comes to characterizing the pollution that affects the border region. Uh, but, you know, the other pictures show uh, many sources that I'm sure are found, you know, traffic, heavy machinery, rail, um, you know, off-road, off you know, we're a, um, we're a mecca for off-road, you know, our large city uh, folks want to get out of, you know, the, the busy, busyness of, of cities and they come out here and tear up the desert, leave, and then the winds come in and you see these um, movie scenario kind of wind effects. We fail persistently to meet federal standards for clean air, for clean water, and other contaminants. Um, and we are home for one of the three toxic dumps that exist in California. Okay, Dr. Dr. Okay, great. Thanks, Luis. Um, I just wanted to, uh, you know, we've been talking about particulate matter in, you know, the previous presentation and in this presentation. I just wanted to show. Um, everyone uh, the, this photo just to put things in context so th this is a, a a figure of um, uh, showing a, a piece of human hair which is about 50 to 70 microns in diameter and just compared to uh, to a, so, some fine beach sand and uh, the respirable uh, particulate matter PM10 is uh, a lot of this is composed of dust and pollens and mold so that's less than 10 microns in diameter. So you can see how that's just a, a piece of, uh, of, you know, of the uh, human hair. And then uh, the fine particulate matter of PM 2.5 is less than 2.5 microns in diameter. So you can see that's how small that is just being a piece of that PM 10. Uh, so this community air monitoring network measures both the fine and respirable uh, particulate matter. Um, where our goal was to put a network of 40 monitors out. We needed wireless connectivity for real-time reporting. And since the temperatures commonly exceed 100 degrees Fahrenheit in Imperial Valley, we needed custom shelters built, checked from the extreme weather there. So inside that um, box, we, uh, we have a, um, a low-cost op uh, laser particle counter, an optical particle counter. Um, in this case, it was a Dylos a small a microcomputer and other environmental sensors, including measuring temperature and humidity, wireless networking, and then uh, the, the data can be uh, real-time transmitted to an internet data on the, on the cloud. Uh, this was uh, developed by Edmund Cito's lab and Graham Carlin at University of Washington. Um, we did first lab and field validation of the monitors. Um, you can see the picture on the right. This is where we uh, were able to co-locate our experimental monitors with, um, with regulatory monitors from the California Air Resources Board and the Imperial Irrig Irrigation District. We also did a validation exercise with portable um, EVAMs, which are um, reference monitors. And we formed a technical advisory group, a work group of air quality stakeholders and include the local air district um, and CARB and the US EPA. Um, we also um, 
worked with the community to um, recruit sites. And um, also from the very beginning of the project, we had an aim of building local capacity by uh, doing trainings of, uh, on monitor assembly and installation troubleshooting repair with Gomete staff and uh, uh, several of, of those staff went up to University of Washington the lab were trained how to assemble these monitors. And we, we thought about from the beginning, who owns the data? Um, and the, the data was reported in the beginning to the University of Washington and to the Track and California servers, but um, it was eventually transferred to CCV, Comité Civico de Valle, um, to their servers, and um, they were uh, trained and uh, learned how to uh, maintain those servers. They were already using a community web platform, which was adapted for this use. So this shows you, uh, this pyramid shows you uh, how we developed the community participation uh, model for the program. We had uh, Comité Civico de Valle as the partner, co-investigator. We had a community steering committee, which helped guide project activities throughout. Uh, did some of the decision making and conducted outreach and represented the project and then community participants who hosted the monitors and identified community actions. We uh, did uh, some of the data collection with a um, with uh, mobile devices. This uh, we did uh, uh, we had individuals going around looking for for possible sites for the monitors. Um, with some criteria and they were uh, on their um, cell phones and they were able to take pictures or videos of the sites and upload them. Um, this was the, um, the web platform that already existed called Identifying Violations Affecting Neighborhoods or IVAN, uh, innovative crowdsource mapping tool that was developed by Comité. And this was modified to enable data collection for this effort. So this uh, shows you the uh, map on the left this is again the Imperial Valley, which is uh, uh, situated right uh, uh, north of the international border. Mexicali, the capital of Baja California, is uh, right south of the border. And then the Salton Sea, which is a, a, a drying uh, lake bed, which is also contributing to the pollution problem, is, is at the north port portion of the valley. You can see on the left side just the uh, five regulatory modern monitors that existed before. And then uh, on the right, the, uh, the 40 monitors that we ended up deploying in the project. Um, here's some of the uh, scientific findings that we had from doing this project. We were able to detect 10 more uh, air pollution episodes in the regulatory network because we had 10 more times monitors. Um, we found that the, um, that the regulatory agency, the Air Resources Board was under reporting the top reading of the course of particulate matter well, we discovered that with the use of our experimental monitors and it was corrected. We did a performance evaluation of four years of the, um, of the network. And we found that the, the uh, annual mean levels of, P of PM10 did not differ statistically from regulatory annual means, but it did for PM2.5 for two out of the four years. So it is measuring uh, PM10 more accurately than the fine particulate matter. And then as you might expect, um, comparing our, our um, low cost instruments to these high end regulatory monitors that our um, sensor variability was higher than the regulatory monitors. Um, and then I guess I'm gonna turn it back over to Luis um, to talk a little bit about some of these best practices. And I'll just, as you talk, Luis, I'll just uh, uh, go through some of these slides just to, to prompt you, but um, go ahead and talk about some of the uh, best practices and, and lessons learned and I'll keep moving the slides. And don't forget to unmute yourself, please. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, of course. Um, so uh, one thing that I do want to highlight is that we we have had a, a long history of partnership uh, with Tracking California, Dr. Paul English and his team. And that was very important to build uh, trust uh, to, you know, I was joking with uh, Dr. English earlier as, you know, asking me, you know, mention, you know, how, you know, our collaboration when we met, I said, you know, which, which one was it, happy hours? <laughs> you know, because I think it's just so important uh, just to be able to build trust and relationship, especially uh, because historically, you know, a lot of times scientists, 
you know, their goal is to publish, you know, there's these academic pressures and research pressures, a lot of times that we miss the opportunities um, to build uh, a, a unified uh, goal, uh, with both the community and, and the research uh, objectives. Um, we uh, work with, um, well, Comité Civico has had a long history of, of working in outreach, uh, community engagement, and uh, with community health workers. Um, we also have a, a rapport with the community that trusts us. Um, so that, that was very helpful uh, in getting us to where we were um, in order to be able to respond to what the community was asking for. And the community, like I mentioned earlier in the photo, you know, is they, they, they're aware of, of the surroundings and, and the sources, but a lot of times they're not able to make a case. So for that reason, um, it was very simple to bring a community advisory committee, uh, people that already are advocates or represent organizations or advocacy organizations. Um, and so that was, uh, that was really important to help us advise the research uh, throughout in, in its entire uh, uh, life of the research itself um, during the, the funding period that the National Institutes of Health funded it. Uh, it was also important to assure that the research didn't just stand in the, in the period of time that the research was funded and it's testament to that we continue and have grown uh, the um, the results of the research, which is an established air monitoring network. Um, again, you know, we engage technical experts. Well, you know, the technical experts were the researchers themselves, Dr. Paul English, his team, who brought in uh, air, air monitoring experts. Uh, we continue to work. So as an organization, we were able to secure additional resources to continue on the project and to continue to, to have the same original team I mean, it's been over five years now, uh, well over five years, uh, that we've maintained uh, almost pretty complete team since the onset of the study. Uh, it was also important to have the community and help us inform because they gave us access to people that they knew. Um, in fact, one situation where we couldn't get into a local water and power utility, which is a, a public water and power utility, they continue to create roadblocks for us to put these low cost sensors in a existing air monitoring stations that the uh, water and power district already had. And they kept creating barriers by putting in front of us easement um, applications to, to have easement access or I forget the exact name of it. Uh, and John Hernandez, who at that time was serving as a um, consumer advisory committee, just picked up the phone and, and let them know that we had the interest of getting access. And immediately they filled out the entire application for us. So what could have been a no-go just became a, a, an immediate um, uh, removal of a barrier. Uh, community participation and site recruitment, monitoring deployment, um, Again, you know, like in some of these photos you see here, we were able to partner with the local high school. They used their welding shop to help us build our first uh, monitor stand uh, that we then started uh, replicating to put on top of buildings. Um, community access and ownership of data, that was really important. Again, you know, we didn't come in knowing all these things. We kind of learned them along the way, but it was really important that the, because part of the research to action uh, and the design of it was to hand over full ownership and build complete capacity so that the, in this case, Comité Civico or the community, as we prefer to say it, had uh, full ownership and access. And so we already had the crowdsourcing database. It made sense to build the air monitoring uh, component of it into it. Uh, and on this uh, slide here, you see some of the screenshots from the Ivan. Uh, we call it Ivan Air now. Uh, as you can see, you know, it has monitors, uh, map of monitors, where the monitors are at, and get alerts. Uh, we have since been able to build capacity to retain uh, a programming expertise within the organization, which is very, very rare uh, to have, you know, a grassroots community organization being able to sustain full time um, programming, which by the way, this 
capacity has been allowed us to be able to build multiple databases beyond the air monitoring. We were able to build a better database than what was out there available for vaccines. We have a asylum humanitarian issue. We were able to build a database for that. So we have been able to build capacities that have been useful beyond the monitoring program. Uh, and this is just another uh, screenshot of the Ivan Air. Uh, again, we have a new uh, facelift of the site itself that we're working with uh, Dr. English's team again to, uh, you know, technology keeps changing. We wanna make sure that we keep change the way it looks, making it easier, making it more accessible, making it to where it's it's language uh, appropriate, you know, for the region that, that we live. Another thing that's important is that this um, database now lives in eight communities throughout California, which is part of another, it's, it, we have an environmental justice enforcement task force. We have the uh, complaint system, and, and now we're able to, uh, to communicate air quality and air quality alerts to the community, real time, by the way, or near real time. Uh, again, lessons learned, uh, early communicate, uh, community engagement is critical uh, to build trust. Uh, this one's important because as was mentioned earlier in the picture that was shown about the Salton Sea, the Salton Sea is one of probably perhaps the biggest climate crisis that we have, you know, with um, the drought conditions along the Colorado, much of that Salton Sea that has been used as a sump for agriculture, um, past military proving ground, it's basically a toxic dump that has a water to keep that dust uh, uh, under control is now, as we are transferring water to larger metropolitan areas, the shoreline is shrinking or is increasing. And now it's exposing all that contaminated air. And historically we've had researchers that, are, that have come out but are not creating research to solve problems. Uh, so it's important, again, to build trust because a lot of our communities have been burned that way. You know, they'll, they'll draw blood samples, they take off and never come back, you know, with results and that, that kind of stuff. So uh, we've become more, um, uh, I guess we've, uh, I'll say it in these terms, but we kind of put on notice the research world that they're, they're going to come out here, they're going to do community participatory research or research to action. Uh, training should be integrated into building the capacity and sustainability. Um, you know, again, you can read all this, but nature contaminant, monitoring science, siting, hardware, software, troubleshooting, monitor calibration. You know, what I'll say to all of this is that uh, California has passed legislation, AB 617. If we can go back, Dr. English, real quick, if you don't mind, uh, has passed legislation, AB 617. And the legislation was also, in, was actually inspired by the work that we did here in Imperial. Now it's become a major piece of legislation. There it is. Thank you, I didn't get to that one. Um, and so one of the things that we're really advocating for is just, it's not, to go through the process that we went through was allowed us to transfer knowledge and allow us to create a much stronger ability to communicate with air regulators. So it's important to go through this process. Um, one of the battles that we have with 617 is that a lot of times government is finds they find it easier to just say, we're just going to contract all these consultants to do this work. Well, you miss a lot of the opportunity to, uh, to bring capacity and knowledge and education to communities that they can later use that uh, or immediately use that to advocate for change, right? I guess that's the spirit of research to action. Okay, uh, thanks. Thank you very much, Luis. And I uh, just wanted to leave everyone with this uh, uh, list of uh, quite a few publications that we um, have produced in this project. And just um, just to highlight also that um, our community partners, our co-authors um, on these publications, they were also co uh, official co-investigators on the on the NIH grant. So um, they were. Uh, also, uh, the issue of funding, this was a, a, an equitable uh, funding uh, sharing of the project. So not all the money just went to the, the researchers, but also to our partner organizations and uh, to develop capacity in the community. But you can read all about those in, uh, in these publications. Uh, 
Um, so I think that's that's what we have and glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Oops. Um, excellent. Thank you. And I wanted to uh, remind everyone that um, they are welcome to post question on the Q&A chat and then Dr. Turn will moderate the discussion at the end. I wanted to, uh, with great pleasure, I wanted to introduce the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Anna Navasasian. Uh, she is a professor of environmental health sciences at the Columbia University Melman School of Public Health. She is a physician epidemiologist with a specialty in preventing medicine and public health and a PhD in epidemiology. Her research investigates the long-term health effects of environmental exposures, their interactions with genetic and epigenetic variants and effective intervention for reducing involuntary exposures. For more than 10 years, she has worked with the Strong Heart Study to identify major environmental exposure contributing to the epidemics of diabetes and cardiovascular disease affecting American Indian community. I'm gonna turn it to you, Hannah. Thank you, thank you, Francesca uh, and the Health Effects Institute for this opportunity to share some of the work I've been involved with uh, uh, indigenous communities. And, uh, and so as, as I am myself not an indigenous scientist, I wanted to start this presentation sharing some uh, thoughts from Spiro Manson, who is probably one of the top uh, Native American uh, scientists in, in the country. And, and so he really highlights this idea of collective competence and how for tribal communities, authority is rooted in, in this idea of, of working together. And decision-making is horizontal, precedent-oriented and consensual. That can be sometimes challenging, but it's extremely uh, important to recognize that need of consensus. And also it's extremely gratifying at the end as it, as it brings people together once the decision is made. The process is fluid, iterative, recorded orally, so oral traditions are very important, and benchmarked by key events. For instance, we will all remember how life changed before and after the COVID pandemic. Leadership is shared, diffused. There are many leaders in the group and ascribed. That means not only because you are the leader or somebody is the chair, the chairman of the tribe, that's the leadership person. There are many elderly, many individuals in the community who are considered leaders. And the concept of communities being sociocentric as compared to egocentric uh, communities that will be the more traditional European centric type of, of uh, societies. And, and so based on this, collect, I, I like this idea of collective competence also because as public health scientists, uh, I think we're, this concept really resonates with how to do public health uh, uh, science in order to uh, solve public health problems. And so the recommendations are, are very similar to, to what our previous speakers have talked. This idea of building relationships is extremely important to engage between scientists and, and tribal communities. And the participatory approach is essential. There is no, it would not be possible to do work with tribal communities without this participatory approach. And we need as scientists to accept the research codes that tribes have developed that regulate the collection and circulation of information about their members. And the reason for these codes is based on past negative experience. And, and I am going to come back to this in a, in a little uh, while. And that's why it's so important for us to recognize and respect uh, these uh, regulations or these uh, uh, recommendations. First of all, uh, in addition to our academic IRBs, the tribes have their own IRBs. So all our research projects need to be reviewed and provide that community consent, which is so essential for environmental research because not just the individuals are affected, which is uh, normally uh, goes through the regular informed consent, but air pollution, water pollution, toxic waste sites affect communities as a whole. So for that reason, it makes sense that the community needs to provide a consent 
for that work uh, to take place in the in their backyard. So that's what the in uh, the tribes uh, tribal IRBs uh, are can assure. The concept of data ownership, this is something that I was not aware, I was never trained in that concept, but the tribes own the data. It, they've made very clear to the scientists that scientists, we don't own the data. So we need to acknowledge that there is the tribes own the data. And as such, they are reviewing all the work that we do. They review the publications, the lay summaries. So that's add an extra level of, of uh, complication. However, the communities are really interested in communicate of understanding, knowing, participating in research, contributing to research. So it makes sense that we share uh, with, uh, with the communities. They ask us to be to not give their names uh, for several reasons. That's the, in the case of our work, other tribes might have different uh, ideas. And they ask for us to value traditional knowledge. So I want to share uh, with you some of the principles of traditional knowledge that are really important for the work that we do. And we do a lot of water pollution. So really the concept that water is life, which is mini Wichoni in Lakota, is, a, is extremely important and we need to incorporate that. The other concept very important is the seven generation principle. This idea that what we do today, the decisions that we make today are going to affect uh, our generations down the road. And that's very important in environmental work. This is important. We think of uh, uh, work on epigenetics and transgenerational effects. So those ideas really resonate well with, with our work also. And the other pr uh, principle extremely important is relationality and that things are connected in a circular rather than a linear process. I think that goes well with the concept of system science uh, also. So collective leadership, sovereignty, and data ownership, uh, I've already talked about that, and this idea of team science and community and scientist partnership is, is essential. So I am going to now uh, share with you how some of these uh, principles and, and that work has, has taken place as part of the Strong Heart study which is the oldest and largest study of cardiovascular disease in American Indian communities funded by the NHLBI since 1988. So it's a very uh, long study. And this study started with a participatory approach from the beginning, otherwise it could have never uh, really taken place. The communities are located in, in Arizona, the community near Phoenix in, in the communities in Arizona have seen uh, quite important wealth in recent uh, decades, uh, what has been really positive uh, for them. In the Dakotas, the, these uh, communities are much more rural, uh, very uh, spread around both North and South Dakota. And in Oklahoma, they live in towns. They don't live in reservation, but the communities and the tribes still keep their uh, traditions and their culture very, very strong and alive. And one of the main questions that we've looked at in this, uh, this project relates to water contamination. Access to water is a major issue uh, ongoing in many tribal communities around the country. And one of the problems uh, with access to, with groundwater uh, is the contamination with arsenic as one key contaminant, uh, major uh, well-known uh, toxicant. So in, in this slide, I show you how our communities located in Arizona, the Dakotas and, and Oklahoma have varying levels of contamination in the water. And actually we can confirm that the exposure is taking place because the urinary levels of arsenic over time, this is 10 years of uh, data, show higher levels in Arizona, widespread levels in the Dakotas and lower levels in Oklahoma. So the question uh, together with the communities which were very concerned about arsenic contamination with the implementation of the new maximum contaminant level from the EPA was, is this a risk for us or not? So what, that's one of the questions that we've uh, tried to answer together, but arsenic is not the only contaminant. There is actually uranium in the water, abandoned uranium mines <clears throat> are a major uh, problem in the Southwest and also in the Northern Plains. 
So that's, you know, this is from another research group and we've also done some uranium uh, research because it's another major contaminant. So the advantage of having this long-term collaboration between tribal communities and, and scientists is that we can really answer very important questions over long periods of time. And we can go back to old samples to answer new questions. And so that's what we did. We went to our baseline urinary uh, samples to be able to answer if arsenic is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And the answer that we got from that research is yes, uh, there is a clear dose response and higher uh, arsenic exposure as measured in the urine was related to uh, arsenic, to mortality and cardiovascular disease. Arsenic is a particular problematic exposure because you don't know if you are exposed or not unless you measure it. In that sense, it's different from air pollution where communities can have a sense that they are affected. There are many hazardous contaminants where unless you do measurements, uh, it's extremely hard to know if there is exposure or not. So there we've done a lot of work. And so the question is when you get editorials like this, when you move your science and science is making progress, how do we uh, explain this to the community? And what do we do with this information? So one of the issues is the issue of also of mechanistic epidemiology or molecular epidemiology. And there is a lot of interest from at, as scientists to advance as research. And actually the communities also want to know why is this happening? How can this arsenic do something to our bodies? So we are involved in both genetic and epigenetic research and our communities are fully informed of that work. And there is full agreement to do that work. And when we put together some materials to explain what the epigenetics is, for instance, you know, we work hard and we say, if there is no methylation, the gene is expressed. If, when you have methylation, the gene cannot be expressed, but our uh, community member says, this is not easy for us to understand. You need to find better ways. And so we put together with one student uh, she found, she thought about this idea of saying that, you know, epigenetics is like highlighting in a book what really tells the gene, what does it need to focus on? What does it need to do? And that was a, an example of how to communicate complex findings and to continue uh, working together. So we've looked into very deep, high quality science. And that's something I want to really highlight here today is that you can do top-notch science, the best high quality science with full community engagement. We don't need to say this is going to be second class science. Absolutely not. We can do the top, the top uh, level science. And, and so we are looking now at epigenetics as a mechanistic pathways for a cardiovascular disease going into a very interesting findings, replication in animal studies, and this science is, is evolving and is doing uh, really going pretty uh, exciting uh, findings. But what I want to talk uh, today with all of you is about this idea of ownership of this data, you know, this environmental data, health data, mechanistic molecular data, who owns the data and who the ownership means who has the permission, who decides what do we share and in which terms. And the tribes have made very clear to us that they own the data. And as scientists, we need to agree to that ownership. And uh, the reasons is that they've been harmed in the past. And there are many examples of how scientists collected data and then they started doing other things that the community had never been informed or not informed appropriately. For instance, with the Havasupai tribe, uh, research originally supposed to be collected for diabetes started to be used by scientists for other things. Or the Barrow Alcohol Study, a community which once uh, during a conference was in the front page of the New York Times saying that they were alcoholics. And their ability to uh, borrow uh, money 
went down and had tremendous economical consequences for, for the community. So our communities want to see our uh, abstracts for conferences. They want to see our papers for publication. And it makes sense because they could be harmed by the by what we communicate. And in our experience, this sharing has only done our work much better. So communities, tribal communities, are resisting the mandate from the NIH for unrestricted data sharing. And originally, as a scientist, I was not sure about this. You know, naively, I thought sharing data was a good thing. But I've learned to appreciate, and I am extremely thankful to tribal communities for making me uh, aware of the potential dangers of unrestricting uh, uh, data, unrestricted data sharing. And the same way tribal communities are defending our environment, they're also defending appropriate ways of data sharing. The tribes are very happy to share their data, very happy, but they just want to know for which purpose, in which terms the data are going to be shared. They are worried the data could be used in harmful ways, in ways that could harm them uh, down the road. For instance, uh, through the, you know, uh, as you, uh, uh, all of, many of you know, are aware, the, this uh, uh, regulation that the EPA was trying to set up uh, with requ requirements that could potentially harm uh, communities and, and individuals. So in addition to the concept of owning data, it's the idea of who is profiting from that research. And we profit as, as scientists, Obviously, you know, we, I got promoted myself uh, in my career from through this work. Our institutions profit. There is a lot of uh, money going around related to the work that we do. Uh, the country, the world, uh, hopefully profits at the big top level through the advance of science. But how are the communities that contribute their data, their time, their efforts, how are these communities profiting themselves? And I want to bring in this very recent letter in Nature from indigenous scientists. And they want to remind scientists in general that there are so many broken promises that these medical benefits or scientific benefits are going to benefit the communities that provided the original data. And there are so many uh, power inequities that you know precision medicine, it's unlikely to respond to the needs of the communities. So, and also they remind us that data are not a gift and that we have the responsibility of using it appropriately. And also this other work from uh, Publishing Nature recently, a few years ago, that we need, as scientists, we need to really be engaged and giving back and making sure that indigenous peoples can benefit uh, from science not just uh, scientists alone, for instance. So how our research helps, obviously at the country and global level, uh, policy contributing to policy making, hopefully it can help at the regional level with increasing resources, thinking of better prevention, environmental prevention strategies, but, and, but we need to still keep thinking very, very hard at the benefits for the benefits of the local level. So at the regional, uh, a little bit community level, uh, some of the work and other works from many other scientists has helped with improving water access to safe water. There is still so much to do, but things uh, are happening. So that's, that's really, really good news. And many, but unfortunately, many families can still are very limited and cannot connect to these water pipes because there were uh, many uh, in rural areas, access to, to community water systems is extremely challenging. So recognizing uh, that need, uh, in a, several years ago, we started to think we need to move our observational epidemiological research into intervention research. And people, some people said to me even, you are crazy, nobody is going to give money for that work. But you know, we persisted, we work with the, our local communities and fortunately we were able to, to start uh, this work. And I want to acknowledge our local partner, uh, Marcia O'Leary, 
without whom we could not really do uh, any of this, of this uh, action-oriented uh, research. So we put together this uh, uh, randomized controlled trial, which is a multi-level uh, with a high level from a, a tribal uh, uh, engagement. And all the participants received treatment filters for arsenic, but then we compared, we are comparing just a very simple uh, information versus a more complex uh, health promotion program. And you know, when you are an epidemiologist like myself, I was not really trained or prepared to do this type of intervention work. So we really need to engage the social scientists, the behavioral scientists, and obviously our local uh, partners who really knew what could work and what couldn't and what was needed. And, and really uh, think about which factors to consider at, at each level. And, and so now uh, our study has been uh, going on and uh, all the families have access to uh, have this faucet, these filters that have been installed with uh, uh, treating uh, arsenic. And now the water is free of arsenic and we have all these other uh, materials especially this tank card, which was a community initiated idea that they could uh, collect the water with their uh, filter so that the, the water was ready for cooking and for needed at any time, because this faucet can a little, sometimes be a little bit slow. So you want to as much as possible uh, allow that the water is ready to use at any time. So I've talked about water and focus on water uh, today. But uh, water is not obviously the only problem affecting uh, tribal communities. There are many other issues going on. And air pollution is one of them related to uh, natural gas and, and oil uh, production with many, many challenges uh, at, the, at the tribal and community level. So you can see uh, this, this has been, uh, uh, can be quite uh, dramatic. So I am going to finish uh, this talk uh, just highlighting that communities and participants are make research possible through their engagement and participation and their support of science. And they are essential to contribute to research questions and to actually contribute to the conduction of research. And we as scientists need to ensure and make uh, sure that the communities can and benefit from uh, research. At the same time, we need to uh, communicate carefully and well that benefits can be slow and that science has also its own timelines that, that sometimes, and we need to see how they match, how they align with the community uh, uh, time because communities also expect uh, success, maybe sometimes much faster than what we provide as scientists. And, but we need, we need that engagement. And funding and sustainable funding is, is essential for participatory uh, research. So very thankful to the funding, very thankful to the Stronghold Study Team, which involves numerous organizations in Oklahoma, North and South Dakota, Arizona, and, and other many other uh, institutions and, and, and organizations. And also I want to particularly uh, thank all the trainees and students, several of them indigenous uh, scientists who have really made major contributions to, to this work in general. And, uh, and really, uh, I think make a real connection uh, with, uh, with communities. And so thank you with that, happy to take any questions. I think we're ready to uh, start to address some of the questions that were posted online. So those go to a, a number of our speakers. So thank you for posting those and we certainly welcome uh, more of those to come in uh, as we continue through the, the, the um, Q and A period and the panel discussion. So um, I'd like to start with uh, and, and ask our, our panelists to uh, um, show themselves now and, and unmute. And I'm gonna start with a question for you, Dr. Fuller, um, that came in uh, from uh, Chad Bailey of EPA. And it says, to what extent do community members welcome maps of pollution that show high pollution levels in their neighborhoods or at their homes? And then the second part of that, how often do these communities 
how often are these communities consulted or asked for permission before such maps are published? Oh, yeah, so great question. So um, I found that in my experience, um, communities are very welcoming to having information and data about their communities. They want to know what's going on. Many times they have the knowledge because they see what kind of sources are around, be it trucks or cars, um, industry, and it's kind of validating for them sometimes where they're like, we thought these things were here, now we see that they are. However, as a researcher, um, we usually many times stop there and say, hey, this is what we found, we see this. And community members are like, okay, I see this is bad. Now, what are we gonna do about it? So many times community-based research will continue um, in certain ways. And as researchers, we can help to facilitate that by providing them with the data, um, giving their, their input to it, helping us to, as a, you know, together to really figure out what those means. So a next step can be taken, maybe not directly by the researchers, but by advocacy organizations, educational organizations about what people can really do about it. So that's the next step that communities want to see. Um, and the second question was, how often are, are communities consulted? Yes. Um, or give or often. ask permission to post those maps. Yeah, not very often. Um, as you could see by honest talk, um, research historically has been a very extractive process, even talking about people participating in studies as subjects. And many, many years ago, a community member in Boston um, said, we are not subjects. We don't want to be to you know, considered to be subjects. We are participants. You know, this is a partnership. We are not a subject of something that's being done to us. We are an active participant. Um, so it's just not enough. Community-based, community-engaged research is not what's typical. Usually researchers come in, take data and go off, publish papers and have their livelihoods and they're not as involved. But communities have become a lot more savvy over time and create memorandums of understanding with academia and with other types of researchers. So that fits more of an exchange versus being you know, something that's taken. Okay, thank, thank you, you for that. The, while, while you're speaking, there's just a, a clarifying question for you asking, do we know if the waste sites were located in established minority neighborhoods or if the minority neighborhoods moved in after the hazardous waste site was established? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, so is it, you know, does the chicken come before the egg <laughs> kind of discussion? Right. So, I mean, unfortunately, it's actually both. Um, so... So there are circumstances and there has been evidence, you know, identified where industries have looked for low income um, and minority communities to place them there because they're expecting that there would not be as much pushback. Mm -hmm. I mean, no one wants these in their backyards. And so many times they are directly cited in those places that are less resistant. And then sometimes it's kind of secondary based on um, that perhaps there's an industry there and then the price for residences around there may be lower and affordable for people who don't have as much money um, to come in. Um, and then it happens that way, but it's really both. Sometimes it's intentional and sometimes it's just a byproduct of how our economic system works. Okay, thank you for that. This is a, a question for, um, all of you, um, and it, the questioner asks, in terms of demystifying science and enhancing citizen understanding, can you share any experience and engagement activities involving community lectures about some of the basics? And then how do you find the, the, the right level to engage people and as many as possible? You don't wanna down, speak down to them, but you don't wanna overwhelm them with jargon. So uh, can you speak to that? Anybody wanna jump in there? I am happy to, to start because ahead, I think, uh, you know, that the tribal communities have set up a system that I think works pretty well, and maybe other communities can benefit from this experience. And it's this idea of lay summaries. So for each paper that we publish, we need to have a lay summary. And, then, and we work really hard on our lay summaries, you know, so that they are really 
don't hide any information, but at the same time, don't make it complicated so that anybody can just go and understand it. And, and so together with that lay summary that goes for each paper, uh, we also put together like regular newsletters for our participants. And those also show some of the big highlights. We try to do nice figures so that they are continuously informed and engaged. And then we do town halls, meetings, like once a year we meet in each community. And you know, all this often the students present, some of the high school students who are engaged present, and it's a way, and, and some community members share their own experience and perspectives. And it's a really nice bi-directional uh, way of, of meeting. So I some of those are examples that I think work well. Great. And and Paul, I noted you were about to speak. Well, yeah, I mean, one clarification I was wondering from the questioner when they say community lectures or I mean are they are they asking do the do the actual community give those presentations seems like uh, Anna, as you were mostly talking about the research staff doing translational work um, with uh, with a couple notable examples um, you know of students and I, you know in our project in, in Luis maybe you want to add to this but you know we <clears throat> I think initially you know that that translational, activities were is kind of the responsibility of the, the research team and partners. Um, and then I think over the course of the project, you want to into, you know, get the community more actively involved in that. And, you know, as of now, you know, this is a number of years later, the project, I mean, we have member uh, members of Comité Civico de Valle, uh, you know, doing doing these presentations themselves. Um, they're, they're so, you know, they know this material so much better than than uh, those of us that don't live there locally um, and are continuing to understand some of the challenges of, of measuring air quality. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I, I have to, I can't overemphasize the importance of the translational work. We have um, uh, a couple, several staffers on, on track in California that are, are trained in health education and communication and translation. And I, I think those are integral uh, skills that you really need to have uh, you know, these have to be multidisciplinary um, uh, staff on, on these projects, and that's a really important part. I mean, Luis, did you want to add any, anything to that? Well, I think most of it has been answered, but uh, what I'll add uh, is that uh, don't assume that the community is uneducated or that they don't understand or that the level of comprehension is much lower. Uh, just because people have not had the same level of opportunity or privileges don't assume that knowledge hasn't been transferred, the skill sets haven't been transferred from generation to generation and historically. I mean, somebody built the pyramids, right? And we can't say that they had PhDs or credentials, right? So I think that that's important. And also don't play God. I mean, don't say that this is the information I'm gonna give them and this is the information I'm not gonna give them. I know there's always important to take considerations of how that information is conveyed uh, in a way that is appropriate that is sensible, it's, it's culturally and language appropriate. Um, there's a lot of things to consider, but I mean, don't hold the information if something is causing a harm that the community would benefit from knowing, let them know. Don't hold on to it because as a researcher, you may think, well, we might cause them more stress and they have no way of fixing this. And that's not always the case. So. I think it's 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 a moral responsibility, and um, and I think it's important that people, the community, needs to know, and don't underestimate the community. Uh, as, as Dr. English just said, we have a team of air monitoring experts, and uh, and I can tell you a lot of these capacity low cost sensors doesn't exist within government. It exists outside of government um, because government just knows how to do what government does. You know, give me a regulatory device and I'll do it because that's what I'm being told to do. But if you give me a low cost sensor and try to do everything, I can't do it. And and so, I mean, you know, there's an example as to don't assume things that, you know, just because somebody has a bachelor degree that they, that they, you know, have everything. If anything, I, I, you know, going back to the whole theme of this collaboration and sharing of knowledge Thank you for that, Luis. That was great. Um, Anna, I have uh, something related to that that I, um, I wanted to ask you. Um, does it ever arise that there's tension between traditional knowledge, as you spoke of it, and scientific knowledge? And 
if so, how do you navigate that as a as a scientific researcher? For instance, one one of the issues with the arsenic in the water, as I mentioned, is that you cannot you don't know if it's there or not if you don't measure it. So that's a very clear. Uh, traditional knowledge is not very helpful in that sense because some of the community members will tell us we've always drank that water we always drank that water and that water was fine and 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 so that the connection with disease is actually very hard to do unless you do the science measurements and and so but at the same time uh, communities accept science as something that can help them inform and, and know things that they could not know otherwise. So I, I think communities, as, as Luis was mentioned earlier, they, they, are, they are very smart and they have a lot of understanding that there are many things that can benefit them that are not necessarily from, from their traditional knowledge. But at the same time, what they are saying is there are many things also that we know that has accumulated over generations that scientists should not discard so quickly. Mm -hmm. and should incorporate into, into their work. And, uh, and for instance, one of the things is diet and nutrition. And nutritional, traditional diets have evolved over very long periods of time. And most traditional diets are extremely nutritious. And so these rapid changes in diet, even from clinical trials, scientific clinical trials, can be actually be not necessarily uh, helpful to them. So that's what I think it's a good, some examples of the importance of balancing both traditional knowledge with uh, scientific knowledge. Yeah, thank you. So I have a qu next question for the panel, all of you. Um, concerns have been voiced regarding bias in community engaged or community based participatory research, uh, selection bias, selective reporting bias, exposure misclassification. Um, so as, as investigators that do this kind of community engaged research, how, how would you, is this a valid criticism and, and uh, how do you address that if so? Well, I would just start by saying there's gonna be bias, whether it's a community led study or a, a not community led study or community involved study, you, all those things they mentioned, uh, selection bias, exposure misclassification, those are all common problems in any epidemiological study. So uh, you're confronted with the same issues. So you need to be aware, uh, aware of them. Um, I, you know, I think you know, what I hear more is kind of, a, at least on the uh, air quality monitoring side, the, the criticism you hear a lot is, you know, these you know, these measurements are done by community members. They're not done by you know, regulatory government trained um, experts, so they're not valid. And, you know, we just showed from our presentation that turned out to be the opposite with, in the Imperial Valley where the government monitors were inaccurate and we had to show evidence that they were reporting wrong readings and the community actually had to show the government officials that no, their, their readings were wrong and they had to be corrected. So, um, you know, the, the, these community-led efforts, they're not, you know, they, they're not really, as I said in the beginning of my presentation, they're not supposed to, you know, replace regulatory action, uh, regulatory monitoring. The regulatory monitoring is really for compliance of air quality regulations. That's not the goal of, of the community-led uh, efforts. Um, so they really are more complementary, uh, but they can really get, you know, enrich the data, enrich the, you um, uh, the whole process, and they, I think they can more accurately lead to public health actions. Anyone else want to comment on that? I just want to add, there's a, a lot of misbehavior when it comes to science, and that's important to recognize. You know, I, I deal with government, I deal with academic researchers. Um, everybody has some kind of bias or some intentional misbehavior. Um, it's unfortunate, but communities need to be aware and the more they get involved in research to action, community participatory research, they, and, and knowing their own community, they will know and they will better understand, you know. So it's important, to, again, the research to action, why? Because, you know, you bring in the knowledge, bring in the information, and then you put it to work. But along that, putting it to work, you find, you know, there's all kinds of, you know, strange things that happen, um, you know, it's reality, it's a human behavior. 
And so we need to be very careful, very watchful, and you know, take care of your partners that are good to your community and have proven themselves to 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 be good partners. And you know, call it call out those researchers that are misbehaving, or call out the governmental researchers because you got research in academia, research in government, um, and and just you know, expose them because they have no business. Uh, I don't believe that that's what they get taught. I don't believe those are the ethical behaviors, but they're out there. It's, it's just a human behavior. Yeah, I have to say, I, I agree with Luis and Paul. Um, and I think one of the benefits of doing community engaged research when we are pairing up um, academic or government researchers and community members is that you are forced to discuss what some of those biases can be. And so once they're out there, then you can address them because sometimes it's intentional. A lot of times people just have ways of thinking that they just think is correct and it's just not. Um, and they just really need to be um, you know, put aware to what that is. So the partnerships, if it's a good functioning partnership and we can talk kind of about that, um, you really have to understand those underlying, uh, underlying um, assumptions and biases. Thank you. Um, a question came in, I think directed for you, Anna, but uh, maybe applicable to others. It says, uh, do you include, quote, owners of polluting sources, unquote, in your community of collaboration? Um, I think you may be surprised that owners of polluting sources are willing to voluntarily mitigate air and water pollution beyond what is required by regulation. And the questioner um, speaks of uh, the burning of rice field agricultural waste as an example where um, there was action to correct that that was voluntary. So. That, that's a very interesting question. I can think for instance, for us, uh, that would relate to the, uh, there is a lot of abandoned mines and mining activities that are source of uh, metal contamination in the water and also in dust and, and other uh, sources, probably air pollution also affected too. And the thing is that there is a lot of tension in the communities between those, you know, the industrial activities and, and often, but sometimes, sometimes the, some of the, the, the tribes that are not a unified voice either, you know, and there within the community, you have different perspectives. And, and, and that for sure, that's true for some of the natural and, and, and oil uh, development, that's going to be the case that not everybody in the community is against those industrial activities, for instance. No? And, and so that so far in our case, we haven't done it, uh, but uh, because it, the work we've done mostly is related to naturally occurring uh, contamination but I can see how down the road, as actually we are involved more and more in these abandoned mines issues, and, and there is some industry that actually wants to reactivate some of the mines, I can see how that could be potentially be beneficial. And again, consensus is very hard to reach, but if you reach consensus, that can be very helpful. Yeah, it's, we should probably point out that there are times when the owner of a hazardous site is long gone and it's been the company's been bankrupt and sold and it's really hard to identify the party of response who's responsible um oh, i'd like to, to that one yeah. oh go ahead christina Sorry. um yeah so this is an example that has to do with air pollution but it has to do with um, with waste with actually the um putting of um, tires old tires and um, contaminated land with tires um, in the southeastern part of atlanta and so I work with communities that are there. And um, it, not all industries and companies are going to act the same. So unfortunately, there were companies that say that they are recycling their tires. And honestly, they'll just take the tires and actually dump this, them in this community. 
Um, but however, there is another tire recycling company that actually does what they're supposed to do in terms of disposal of tires. And then they were contracted and they decided to work to pick up those tires and really take them to a proper um, recycling facilities. So um, many times in the same community, you would have a similar industry and some are interested in doing the right thing and others. Like what Luis was saying, you have to work with those people that are interested and have your interests at heart. Mm -hmm. May I make some comments as well? Yeah, go ahead, Luis. Uh, two very quick comments. Um, one is I, I find it more often that in responsible industry, that you will have your bad actors, um, but there are responsible industries that do want to do the right thing. However, a lot of times communities and those who like economic development and politicians, a lot of times they set up these companies for failure because they tend to sell their access um, for a cost. And a lot of times set up companies to circumvent the laws versus to meet the laws and make the appropriate community benefits. So therefore only a few people benefit and the broader community loses, the companies a lot of times lose because they're brought into these conditions. The other example is um, in specific, very specific example, we have a toxic site in one of our neighborhoods and you're real close, you know, just a few blocks from where our office is and Department of California, Department of Toxic Substances Control Agency, um, very inappropriate and strange characters there that tend to have um, abused their power and would not go out and test the community for toxic contaminants that may have drifted and their position into the neighborhood. They refuse to do it. In fact, they've told me they don't want to do it because it might, it would cost them money and, and they don't know what the historical use is, all kinds of excuses. Um, yet another agency, which is the Air Board, stepped up and provided an, uh, uh, over a million dollars in resources. And we have a partnership with Dr. English and others to go out and actually do what government should be doing. So there is a lot of misbehavior in government, a lot of politics. It's either incompetence or deliberate interference. It exists. Corruption exists. So, you know, it's, I mean, you gotta call it what it is, you know? So just wanna share that if you think you suspect some strange things going on and your neighborhoods aren't getting responses then the, then, it's okay to go out and investigate it. That's what government, that's what people are for. The government of the people, we need to make sure that we hold them accountable. Okay, thank you. Um, another question has come in um, regarding trainees who are recruited into PI's projects. Uh, what do you recommend as must do's to establish relationships and trust building with community partners? And I would add that doesn't just apply to trainees, right? That's anybody who's trying to uh, engage with a community um, and I think, you know, we could think about it from the standpoint of trying to engage a community where you haven't worked before versus maintaining trust with a community where you have established relationships. Uh, I'd like to kick off that conversation by saying that I am not, not a PhD. You know, I, I never really sought out to be a researcher in any way, but in our partnership with Tracking California with Dr. Paul English, um, I mean, somehow we've ended up, you know, uh, helping uh, contribute to uh, textbooks. We've helped, uh, been, you know, a, a co-PI with Dr. English and his, you know, other partners on numerous publications and numerous research studies. Um, I, as I said, I'm not a PhD by trade. Dr. English and many of you probably have greater value to that, but I appreciate being invited and being brought into because, you know, we've had researchers that have deliberately left out the community because it's not ivory towerly looking enough. And, you know, we see it and I'm like, all right, fine, whatever, you know, that's where you feel your comfort is, it's fine. Dr. English and his team don't have to invite us to, to be co-leads, co-investigators, co-PIs, doesn't have to, but we, he does it, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you know, it's important to build that capacity in that partnership because once studies are done they could either go on the shelf or they can be put to work and when we have investment in it 
when we're part of that, it's more incentive for us to take that to policy, take that to, you know, change, you know, and, and, and make a difference. And Anna, what would you say about the must do's for the, from the, uh, the investigator? I, I think the first one is to be patient for the students and the trainees. Some, some, including myself, when I started, you know, we are very eager to have that connection. You know, it's very exciting, but, but uh, it's important to be patient so that you have a better understanding and to make sure that this is an engagement that you really want to invest time and effort in it. I think something that it's, you know, it's not just something that you do a little bit and then, oh, I, I did my community thing and that's it and you move on to something else. So I think, so that's why I like, I like saying, make sure the student, the trainee, it's something that they want to invest real time and effort. And, and so that's something I, I always make, want to make sure that that engagement, and that happened to me, the, the study, the Stronghold study made me wait a long time before I, had, I, I was able to engage. And I, because this idea of helicopter science is something that communities don't really like, that you just come in for a little bit and that's it. At the same time, uh, and, and also the other thing I would say is to make sure that the students are okay with spending time with educating, for instance, other high school students, spending time doing this type of activities that maybe are not going to help them with writing a paper. And I think that's true for all of us is that when you do community science, it's not only about writing a paper. There are many other activities that are equally important. And, and so to make sure that the students are understand uh, those aspects. But it's been very successful, I would say. And, and communities like students because they, you know, they are, I think they are able to connect in, in very wonderful ways. Yeah. I'd like to just tag on to what Anna was saying um, that, you know, especially with trainees and students, um, you spend a lot of time listening, a lot of time talking and doing other things that you have not taken any classes about, but are just, you know, what you do when you meet new people. You spend a lot of time talking and listening with them. And, and it takes a good deal of time. And, you know, sometimes there's blurred line between, oh, this is do, I'm doing this for school or for work, but it's also very personal. So it's personal for the people you're working with. So that's be personal for you too. Um, so you have to come into it, you know, with that. And many times students like that because their practical skills, um, it really makes you feel like you're doing more than just crunching numbers or just taking the samples, but actually, impacting people. A lot of students, you know, whenever you go into school, you're doing it for agree to make an impact. Um, at least most of the students that I know going into environmental health. And so they're very pleased to see some action happen from projects that they're working on and working with communities. Um, and then for researchers, again, it takes a lot of time um, working with communities beforehand and um, just getting the entry in the community and it's not going to come from you just going up and saying, I have a doctorate and I'm going to do this. And they're like, no, 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 no. We've known people like you for a long time. This is what we want to tell you. This is what we need you to do. And you really have to respond. Um, and you do lots of work with communities, honestly, that are unfunded um, between grants, because you don't let the research can't just drop just because you don't have an ongoing grant. Um, so you spend a lot of time like outside what's really um, like the academic model, research model of how to do research. I, I remember a project, a CBPR project I started and, and the the influencer, if you will, the, the thought leader in the community was a really feisty 85 year old woman who was just had the community behind her on everything. And she was, you know, getting, getting engaged with her and having these discussions you're speaking of was the key to success for that project. And so um, I, it really clearly resonates with, with me. So one, that kind of one, one, one more advice. Um, yeah. Yeah, don't underestimate uh, the investment in the research. As, as a researcher, don't underestimate the investment in communities. Um, 
when Dr. English and his team found us, we had very limited uh, capacity and knowledge around research. The opportunities were coming to us so that we on the ground can provide support. Um, you know, I don't know, 10, 15 years later, opportunities are going both ways. Either we secure opportunities and we bring in a Dr. T, a English team or vice versa. And we always have work going on, going back and forth on both directions. So don't underestimate the capacity and the future opportunities that will come on both directions. And that's a nice segue to the next question I was gonna ask, which is really how do we measure success in community engaged research? Uh, clearly it's not just publications in high impact journals, right? There's also building capacity that, that uh, Luis just spoke of, but, um, and then Dr. Fuller, you mentioned getting EPA to mitigate lead hazards in people's yards. I think that's a pretty dramatic example, but are there other examples of how we should measure success? Well, one, one other thing that Luis talked about, which <clears throat> was a real big success from, from the Imperial Project, is that this um, major legislation was passed after a project um, was near completion, which the project was a, a model for this legislation, AB 617. And this provided um, millions of dollars of funding for community uh, organizations in California to develop their own uh, community air monitoring um, projects. So that's, um, I mean, seeing something translated in, into a policy action and actually actual funding coming from that. I mean, I don't know if every project can expect that, but um, I think that that was a, a real success of, of what we did. Okay, another question is what happens when uh, the community is in concerned with say an exposure or an outcome that you're not funded to study. Um, and you're trying to work within that community, meet their needs, but also you have deliverables for your research grant. I think that part of that problem is with the fun the funder and the, the funding. I think, it need, I think it needs to be more flexible to accommodate that, but you're gonna run into a problem if you're gonna show up and say you were funded to do this we can't listen to any of, of your other issues um you, you know i think you're you're really going to need to try to incorporate the, those other concerns somehow in, into the research even if you're not directly funded but uh, i really think that we need to go back to the funders and and um have them provide more flexibility on that issue because if you're going to have successful uh community-based projects you're really going to need to be attuned to the needs and the, and the requests of the community. I don't know, Luis, do you have anything to add to that? That's come up probably a fair amount. Well, I think it goes back to the comment I mentioned that we're um, a lot of times we have leveraged resources from foundation. Uh, we uh, also were instrumental in getting a legislation passed, um, uh, AB 1071, which uh, it, directs uh, violation dollars, which many violations happen in disadvantaged environmental justice communities to be redirected into communities in these same communities where these violations are occurring. So now, you know, uh, we've been able to, to leverage some of those resources that, um, that are there to, to help complement some of those things that aren't part of the largest part of the study. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's, I think at some point, you know, it's be careful what you ask for, because even as communities, sometimes we ask and we ask and a lot of times we end up getting and, and then we're all busy. So um, I, I think we just have to be persistent, build partnerships and everybody, you know, carries out their roles. We're advocates. We're going to be pounding on doors and kicking down doors and utilizing every possible means, including our elected officials. And researchers do their job, you know, and I think that's what creates a really good partnership. Uh, so we're covering all, all, all entrances and exits to make sure that we, we deliver as best possible to the concerns that the community has. But you are going to reach points where there are, you reach limits either, you know, we've exhausted capacity, the community's over research, their, you know, their time is overspent and and you know that's okay. That's that's you know we just put it into a longer term, midterm, long term plan. Yeah, 
Okay. Yeah, I, I have an addition to that. Um, so, I mean, when I first started, you know, researching many years ago, um, pretty much I would just add in other outcomes or exposures that community members wanted, you know, to the projects and just kind of adding that on, no additional funding or anything. Um, and some things that have come up, you know, I focus on air pollution research, um, maybe issues of water quality have come up definitely in the Atlanta area on the Southwest side, um, issues about jobs and also mental health. Um, so I've added those pieces on. I'm, I'm happy to see that some funders are um, beginning to be more flexible, like it was just said, with funding and specifically with the Hercules Exposome Research Center. Um, one of the good things about that, and it's a really large center grant, but there are research projects that are um, implemented by the researchers that then includes the community partners, but then the community partners also have their own pot of money to do their own individual research studies. So having the resources so that they can say, you know, this air pollution um, and other um, exposures are a concern, but really for the short term, we also wanna look at this additional one and the funds are there so that they can do that and also the technical assistance too. So to see that more flexibility is gonna, you know, would be great an asset to really fund this kind of research going forward. So I am going to, Peter, just add one very quickly. Yep. Uh, something that we can also do is to enable relationships with other, with other scientists and other groups and understand that we cannot do everything and, and we are not experts. I don't know, you know, there are problems that are beyond my own expertise, but often we have connections, we know other people. So facilitating those interactions and introductions, I think that's another way to help. Yeah. Good, good point. Thank you. Um, we are like four minutes from the end of our session and we have many more questions than we have time for, which is a good situation, but I'm sorry we won't be able to get to everyone's questions. So I wanted to get to this, this one because I think it's, it's relevant to, um, to uh, the discussion we've been having here. Can, can you share your perspectives on how under-resourced communities respond to cost issues of new interventions in the community? Um, and one example is uh, adding efficient ventilation for better indoor air quality. So um, how, do you pro how do you address the, the uh, cost issues for an intervention? Anybody want to take that? I think specific the answer is you build it into the, the grant, right? <laughs> specific to air ventilation, like air filtration, that kind of stuff? That... Well, there's a lot of, a lot of interventions going on now to, to add heap of filtration in homes to reduce exposure to pollutants and and the questioner is asking uh, how, how you manage that because you can't expect the the participants to pay for that out of pocket and so the answer to that is you build it into the grant and you supply it but sometimes we actually even are in a situation where we're, we're using electricity and maybe it's it, it we need to make sure that we compensate the participants for the use of uh, that electricity. Uh, I just wonder if there are other examples that anyone thought of. So in, the, in that specific example, in California, as we mentioned, we have AB 617, uh, we have AB 1071. Uh, these are sources of funding. Uh, air districts often also have uh, funding. The federal government, uh, EPA uh, often has funding. Uh, air filtration isn't the solution to pollution. It is a immediate way in which communities can protect themselves of the indoor air quality. Air monitoring, as we do, are doing it, for example, is another way to provide real-time information so people can make informed decisions as to the air quality and how they go about their day to reduce exposure to prolonged unhealthy air, right? So they don't develop asthma and other respiratory problems or exacerbate the respiratory uh, diseases. Um, the funding uh, is is often, as I said, um, you can look at if, if, you know, I know this is probably national uh, audience that you might have here. So, you know, look into your state if you have policies in which the enforcement violations 
are being redirected into these neighborhoods that are being overrun by freight and by other sources of pollution, petroleum wells, anything like that, uh, refineries, et cetera. Uh, and make sure that money is getting sent back. That is not a way to, to generate dollars, but those dollars rightfully belong back in those neighborhoods and communities. And you can turn them into these types of interventions. Um, you know, so that's just a couple of examples as to the, the communities can follow. Yeah, thanks. Um, last question. We, we, we couldn't get through a session at this time without something related to the pandemic, right? So this is asking with our present situation uh, of interactions uh, moving to Zoom, uh, have you seen this opening doors to more and better engagement with communities or has it uh, really shut things down? And uh, are there any upsides or downsides to Could virtual you, engagement? I would like to share a recent experience that we've had is that with the pandemic, they, one of the community uh, uh, members had this idea of doing these virtual cafes on Saturday morning. And then we inv they invited all the communities. And for the first time, participants and community members from the three regions of the Stronghold Study in Arizona, Oklahoma, and the Dakotas, they've come together because always we would meet in one location. Yeah. And that has been amazing. And people had um, new ideas and, and so that such a, would have never happened without the pandemic. So I am, this idea of the Saturday morning cafe, especially during the winter, you know, people now want to go outside and do things like that out, but it was great. Yeah. So just to share that. that that's I was just gonna just say that, um, the, the hardest to reach, most disadvantaged communities, neighborhoods don't have access to the better technologies or any technology at all, or even connectivity to uh, internet uh, or you know, internet connectable devices. So it's still alienating these neighborhoods uh, that we're trying to reach. I think the combination between Zoom and social media sometimes allows us to get the information out uh, it is, I think, uh, facilitating better collaboration among those who are already connected, who are already doing this kind of work, but would have to travel long distances. I, for one, am ready to travel again, but, you know, um, you know, Zooms can get, you know, very easily burned out. And I think that might be a research study for the near future you yeah. know, of how the pandemic and how Zooms have really affected our, our lives, you know, both um, mentally, physically emotionally, socially. Yeah, I'm, I'm, maybe there'll be a webinar on that in a few years. So <laughs> I want to take this opportunity to thank our, our panelists. It's been a great uh, hearing from you and having this Q&A and thank all the questioners and sorry to those we weren't able to get to your questions. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Anna next, right? Yep, um, and I'm Anna Rosowski again, I'm a staff scientist at HEI, and I also want to echo Peter. Thank you to our speakers for their excellent talks and to both of our chairs for running this um, illuminating session. Um, all of the slides and talks will be available on our website. Um, and please join us for our following webinars. The, the next webinar from Global to Local Informing Air Quality Policies and Decision Making is scheduled for next Tuesday. And again, please take a few minutes to, um, to complete our survey. And I wanna also thank all of our participants and for your, um, for your really interesting questions and for making a really in um, interesting panel discussion. So thank you again. Thank you.